All right, we should be live on Facebook, everyone. Thanks, Liz. Good evening, and welcome to our fall speaker series in the equine industry program at the University of Louisville. Tonight's panel is the first of three this fall. I'd like to thank our friends and partners at Horse Racing Nation for sponsoring our event this evening and for all of their support. Special thanks as well to Liz Young on my team and Mark Midland at Horse Racing Nation for working out the technical side of this evening's event. And a very special thanks to my entire team in the equine industry program for developing these wonderful topics. The recording will be available after the event as well in case you wanna revisit it at a later date or tell a friend about it. We'll have time for questions tonight, so please use the chat in Facebook Live to submit those questions through the course of our discussion. Tonight, we have a very topical issue for you, and we've assembled a superb group of panelists. The pandemic has had an effect on us all. It's touched nearly every part of our daily lives. The horse racing industry is no exception, and we've all felt the effects of COVID-19. Through it all, however, racing persevered, and we're the only major sport to continue during those tough days back in March, April, and May. Racing went on each and every day, a true testament to all the work of the people that put on the show. The effects of the pandemic are being felt throughout the industry, however, as racing has been conducted without fans. Strict protocols and guidelines have put in, been put in place for all our participants. Each state has dealt with the pandemic in its own way. As a result, the economic model for our sport has and continues to change. Fans are wagering at home through advanced deposit wagering companies, and that translates to less revenue for our racetracks and our horsemen than a person betting live at the racetrack would generate. Handles are going up at many of our race meets, but more importantly, revenues are going down. Some tracks and horsemen have already felt the impact. Others are feeling the impact of this right now. Some will argue the impacts are going to be much worse next year when surplus purse funds have been exhausted. When the pandemic subsides, the question then becomes, how do we get fans back to our racetracks? Tonight's panel is gonna take a much closer look at this. I asked Mike Penna, the Horse Racing Radio Network to moderate tonight's panel. Mike established HRRN back in 2005. HRRN offers great content from the Equine Forum to my favorite, the call-in show, to the weekend stakes preview, and so much more. Mike's passion for racing spans over 30 years. He might make his living in the industry, but for him, it's not a job. It's a lifestyle and a passion. If you listen to HRRN at all during the pandemic, you might have heard Mike talk about tonight's to topic. COVID-19 has changed the way our sport does business. This is racing's now reality. The overriding question, is it sustainable? Mike, over to you. Sean, I appreciate it. And after listening to that wonderful introduction, I'm kind of thinking that maybe you're the one who needs to be doing the radio shows. That was fantastic. <laughs> and let me reiterate one more time, uh, thank you to you and to Liz and to the entire team at the U of L Equine Industry Program for putting this panel together. Um, and as you touched on it, we're gonna have three different panelists with us, possibly a fourth joining us in just a little bit, but we're gonna, tackle this topic from a few different angles. And uh, so what I'd like to do is start by introducing each of our panelists here, and then I'll throw a question out and we'll let them answer it. And we'll just kind of take it from there. And guys, I'll tell you, when, when we get into the conversation here, if you have something you'd like to weigh in on, you don't have to wait for me to ask you a question, feel free to chime in. And if we make it more of a conversation or a discussion than a question and answer, that works out well too. So we'll just uh, see how it flows. But First and foremost, let's do our formal introductions. And the man joining me on the top of your screen, right next to me, is Terry Finley, who is the founder and CEO of West Point Thoroughbreds. West Point, of course, the largest thoroughbred partnership company in the world. And they probably most well-known, at least recently, for campaigning Kentucky Derby winner, Always Dreaming. And Terry, I think the picture behind you is a picture of Always Dreaming. So uh, that ties in very well. Welcome. It is. It, it, uh, 
great to be here with you guys. Really is. <clears throat> yeah, happy to have you on board with us. Just below me is Andrew Offerman, who is the Vice President of Racing Operations at Canterbury Park in Shakopee, Minnesota. Andrew, welcome. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. All right. And then next to him is Jack Jazorski, the Executive Vice President of Monarch Content Management, which represents the simulcast interests of 14 racetracks across the country. Jack, happy to have you along. Good to be here. Thanks. All right. Well, let's start this way, guys. Uh, Sean kind of touched on what this, this panel is going to be about, racing's now reality. And I know that each of you in your respective businesses, the racetrack side of things, the ADW side of things, and the ownership side have had to make adjustments. You've had to do things a little bit differently now since the pandemic hit and things really started to lock down back in March. So Terry, let's start with you from the ownership side of things. And, and you, you'll each get an opportunity to answer this question, but from the ownership side, what things have you had to do differently? Have you had to make some adjustments over the past few months? Well, I, I tell you, Mike, when I was uh, thinking about our talk tonight, um, I, I thought about the ecosystem of the industry. And I think that's the thing that was interrupted uh, you know, for all of us across the, uh, the spectrum of our industry. But especially for the owners, you know, the sales were disrupted, uh, the two-year-old sales, everything got pushed back. Um, the buyers uh, that came over for the yearling sales uh, it, 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 in uh, past years, they couldn't come over over for uh, the phasic Tipton and uh, the Keeneland sales. So I, I think at, at its core, I think the disruption of the ecosystem is what's affected owners uh, in the biggest way during uh, COVID. Yeah, I'm sure that that schedule changes and the, the different um, adjustments that people have had to make in terms of the sales schedule and all of that has played a role. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. Andrew, how about for you at Canterbury Park? What things have you had to do differently? Yeah, obviously, you know, all racetracks at the beginning were, were significantly impacted, some more so than others based on where they were at in our live race, in their live racing seasons. Um, you know, we were pretty dramatically impacted immediately based on the, the close proximity to the beginning of a seasonal racing meet that's not, you know, well known for being close to other states that conduct horse racing. So a lot of our horse people travel from pretty long distances, um, need some amount of certainty to know that when they're going to be there, there's going to be a meet. Um, so it really impacted, you know, almost immediately what our meet was going to look like if we were going to be able to hold one at all. Um, the industry had obviously started to kind of figure out what a no fan model uh, looked like and how that could be successful. Um, so we were benefit, you know, we did benefit from those that had come before us and then the adaptions that they had made, you know, in terms of all their different protocols. Um, but that was a dramatic undertaking to make sure that you're keeping people um, safe and that you're providing, you know, safe dwellings for the people that live and work in the stable area. Um, that you're providing, you know, safe environments for your employees, that you're able to hire employees in the first place. Um, so it, it really was a, a massive, uh, you know, ecosystem to borrow Terry's term that, that was uh, upended when you kind of look at putting together a seasonal racing season uh, and getting people to come for the racing season, preparing for what they expect when they got there. And then from our perspective, um, you know, preparing initially to be a, a no fan model um, where we are typically, you know, drawing 6,500 people a race day and are largely focused on, you know, events that can generate large on track attendance numbers. We drive, you know, numerous days a season that draw between 15 and 20,000 people. That obviously, you know, is a whole a different business model than maybe um, other, some other race tracks, but we drive a significant amount of our seasonal revenue through attendance food and beverage, um, general kind of entertainment practices as much as racing. So it was a, a complete change in our business model to move from, you know, days of the week that are typically um, good entertainment days in the Midwest in the summer, the Thursday through Sunday, to a, a model that really was trying to capitalize on some of the things that had been seen in the early stages of the pandemic and, and capitalize on that Monday through Thursday off-track market because we knew that that was likely to be um, the lion's share of our revenue opportunity for the summer. Um, we were fortunate that we got the ability to host some limited patrons throughout the season. So the model kind of became a little bit more of a hybrid 
um, but it was a, a dramatic departure for a business that's used to really driving most of its business through um, the entertainment of racing as much as the wagering of racing. Yeah, massive undertaking. And the numbers that you were able to create, even with fans not in attendance, were very, very strong. Record numbers, as a matter of fact, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Jack, how about for you? Some different things that you have had to do on your end of things to adjust to the to the pandemic? So our adjustment came early on um, in mid-March when track started shutting down as uh, someone that deals with simulcasting and buying and selling betting rights back and forth, uh, content very quickly started to disappear literally around the world. Uh, Europe shut down, Australia even shut down for a little bit, Japan, Hong Kong, South Korea. And then by early April, we were down to uh, just a handful of tracks in the U.S., so on one hand, um, we're trying to find any kind of content for customers at Express Bet to bet on. And we literally was almost kind of a reverse whack-a-mole in that, you know, we'd get a deal to import Ch Chilean tracks for people to bet on. And then Chile, Chile would shut down and you wouldn't have any racing from there. So it wouldn't do you any good. Um, on the other hand, um, the tracks that were running, um, and I thank God to this day for Gulfstream Park, which never shut down. Um, we were sending those tracks literally around the world. And I was working with Fonner Park and Will Rogers and sending those tracks along with Gulfstream to Europe, to Australia, to South America, because literally there was almost nothing to bet on. And so people were desperate for it. And I think you could see, uh, especially with sports shutdown, other sports shut down in the U.S., in April of 2019, Gulfstream handled about $100 million dollars. In April of this year, Gulfstream handled over 250 million. So people wanted to bet on stuff, but there wasn't enough out there. And we were literally just hoping to, you know, we had seven day a week racing, at least one track going. And we kept that going between collective efforts until tracks started reopening in early June. So um, that was really our crunch time. Things have kind of, I don't want to say normal, but things have kind of slowed down a bit where we're not running around. But now with this shift to a lot of online wagering, you're seeing people re-examining the model as far as how that betting dollar gets divvied up among the industry stakeholders as to whether we need to look at that again now that a lot of this betting has gone online. And sure, some of it's going to come back to brick and mortar. That's for sure. But a lot of it's going to stay online, which definitely affects how everyone gets paid out of that takeout. Yeah, it's a great point. And that's really one of the issues that's at the crux of this whole conversation is with fans not being in attendance to bet the races on track and strictly betting off-site through ADWs, is that model sustainable long-term? And uh, Andrew, I'll go back to you here for a minute. You said you've had to make several adjustments. I mentioned how good your simulcast numbers were. Your off-track numbers were record-breaking uh, at Canterbury Park. Is that model sustainable long-term if we don't get fans back in attendance? Strictly, you know, from Canterbury Park's perspective, um, I, I don't think that it would be sustainable in its entirety. I think that there is a potential hybrid model in our case where we look at some of our um, maybe worst performing days uh, through our old model and try to replace them with better performing or less competitive days. And I think you can make a case that you know, some sort of a hybrid model would probably be a better result. Um, whether it's sustainable or not, you know, I can say for a fact that the, the revenues that were lost um, from our lack of patrons were not made up for even despite record wagering. So from just truly a bottom line perspective, um, it, you know, we did not have, we need to do even better than a record, let's put it that way, to make it sustainable under the current model. Wow, that's, um, that's a lot of work, my friend, trying to, <laughs> Cap, trying to do better than a record to uh, <laughs> being sustainable. Uh, Jack, you mentioned kind of a different way to look at divvying up the pie, if you will, uh, and maybe a new revenue model associated with, with the fact that we are now seeing all this revenue coming through ADWs and off track. Has that been discussed? Um, without going into details, I think uh, horsemen in particular. Um, Look, when a bet's made on track or at an OTB, I think we all know that, you know, whether it's a simulcast or a live bet, the horsemen are sharing in that. Um, unless your state has what's called a source market fee, 
where a percentage of each bet goes back to the industry in that state, you don't get anything when it's on Navy W, if it's not on your live race. And even if it's your live race, you know, I, I have the benefit of representing some, you know, very high quality tracks like Gulfstream Park and Del Mar and Santa Anita that, you know, I can charge a premium to an ADW for and get a pretty fair return. But if you're at a smaller track or a regional track, you may not have that luxury. And, you know, for these ADWs, you know, express bet included, um, your costs don't go up that much when your handle, you know, doubles, you know, express bets up 70% for the year and, um, you know, expenses go up some, but so the profit margin for the ADWs right now is pretty high. And I think a lot of purses, you know, it, you know, as uh, you mentioned, they're going to be, they're going to be down next year and that's going to be a struggle for people. We don't recapture that money for the industry one way or the other. Some tracks and purses are going to be hurting. Terry, West Point wouldn't mind having a little bit of that purse money if uh, we can get those purses back up again. But we've already seen some tracks starting to decline. How about the horseman side of things, the ownership side of this? Yeah. Well, I think Jack brings up a good point. It's a, it's a really complex issue. I think we can all agree on that, right? It, you, before you know it, you just have a migraine when you think about all the source market fees and all the different deals and the bigger tracks and, and the smaller tracks. I think the one thing that I see that's a real uh, a plus is, is the fact that we're talking about it. And um, I, I think over the next year or two, I, I think we'll, you know, we'll continue to make some progress. And I, I think the horsemen know now that we can't let this thing slip in, into the background. It's got to be front and center because, you know, our, our future really depends on it. And, um, you know, I, so I think, I think we're going to be able to extract some real value out of, out of the turbulence that we've seen over the last uh, six or eight months uh, on the owner and trainer side. Yeah, I guess the good thing is, and again, if you guys want to jump in, or if you have something to say uh, to add to whatever one of the panelists says, feel free to do it. You don't have to wait for me to ask a question. But I guess one of the good things is to play off of Terry's comments and, and some of the other things that we've already talked about is that People are betting on horse racing. People want to bet on thoroughbred races. And some of that has to do with the fact that we were the only show in town for a while, but we're not anymore. And the numbers are still going up and they're still, it, it, we're still getting a lot of off track wagering. And I think that's a very positive thing, isn't it? I think so. I, I think so. When you look at, at, at the number of hours of, uh, of a nationwide uh, TV, say in uh, 2010, compared to you know what will be projected for 2020 uh, you know i've heard some numbers like you know 80 hours back then and upwards of 900 hours today so um i've had a i've had a good number of people that said you know i downloaded a betting app and i got exposed to horse racing and i really like it it's a lot of fun so i i do think i i, I do think we have some momentum in the public's, uh, in their eyes, um, it's up to all of us to capitalize on that momentum. Jack, Andrew, how do we do that? How do we capitalize? I, in my opinion, you know, I, I don't want to take it, us to take the wrong lesson from this shift to online because I think part of it, you know, look, the, the online has a definite aspects with the sports betting come online because I saw this with FanDuel. FanDuel and TVG are part of the same company now. So back in January on FanDuel, they launched horse racing on their sports betting site. And it did a little bit, but in March when all the other sports went away, it took off. I mean, we were getting some significant handle, real material handle from FanDuel customers on Gulfstream in April and May. And even with all the other sports back now, it's not as much as it was, but we are still getting some significant handle from the FanDuel Sports app. And that tells me people discovered the sport and have stayed with it. But that increased our distribution. I think we got to figure out how to increase the distribution even more. I mean, if you see the model in other countries, whether it's France or Australia or these other places, there are far more places where you are exposed or they have the ability to bet on horse racing, whether it's in your bar or 
more OTBs or set up in your convenience store, there's a kiosk that there's simply not enough exposure to horse racing. We got a little bit of it when we were the only game in town for a couple months and see how just that little bit benefited us. We need to have some more distribution of our product out there so people know, oh yeah, let me let me bet on a horse racing while I'm watching a football game or whatever. I mean, it just, people like action and we ought to give them more opportunities to have it. Andrew? Yeah, I think that Jack nailed it with his response. I mean, it's clear that an increase in exposure had a dramatic impact and that was kind of handed to us through, you know, circumstances beyond our control. Um, and as Terry mentioned, the increase in TV exposure. Uh, I think that that really goes to show you, you know, what could be if we could increase exposure. Um, state of Minnesota has some unique, you know, restrictions. We, we set that record despite uh, ADW customers in the state of Minnesota not being able to bet on our races. Um, so we've been fighting some, some strange laws within the state ourselves. I, I can imagine that we could have easily added another 15 to 20 million to that number if our in-state customers would have been able to uh, wager upon our races. So doing things that we can to expose more people um, to the sport and to the product and continue that, you know, I don't want to say momentum because it's been a difficult year to use the term momentum, but to continue that trend um, has to be one of the major takeaways from, from the past six to eight months. Well, Andrew, let me stay with you on the racetrack side of things. So let's say, for example, that in the middle of 2021, that we are in a position where we are able to welcome fans back to the racetrack. So many fans now have gotten really comfortable with sitting at home, betting races from the couch, having a few cocktails, having a few friends over, whatever it might be. Uh, so how do you now get those fans back to coming out to the racetrack? What, what things are you going to have to do? Yeah, I think we're uniquely positioned um, in that we've been an entertainment hub for the sport and for the area for a long time. Um, and as an established brand, I think that we're going to have a lot of customer loyalty that's going to help us bring those people back on days that they're predisposed to come back on. And I think that's really where our opportunity lies. You know, it, it, it's clear and kind of looking through um, our experiences over the past few months that our, our average performing days um, under this model were better than our average or, or low performing days under our old model. So there's got to be a mixture there of um, being able to focus on distribution on some days and being able to focus on the on-track experience on other days. I think that um, doing things on track that provide unique access to the customer uh, and unique intimacy with the sport are still important. We, you know, we do a ton of different things with the community that have always been successful in terms of giving people access and views that they wouldn't necessarily see from behind their TV or behind their computer monitor. And I think that those types of community outreach efforts will be um, very important to showing people some of the things that maybe they'd missed or hadn't had a chance to see before. So it's, it's a unique blend of trying to, you know, capture some of the upside of this summer with you know, some of our historical practices and focuses on customer service and experience. Um, and we're probably uniquely positioned to be able to do that a little better than some others, just based on what our reputation is and kind of what's expected from us in the local marketplace. All right. So we're getting some questions from some of the folks that are watching us on Facebook Live tonight. And one question, Terry, this might be perfect for you. As we were prepping for the show earlier this afternoon, you and I had a brief conversation and we talked about the fact that the the full crop, the numbers have declined again this year, and we're seeing fewer and fewer horses. The question comes in and says, with COVID shutdown of tracks this spring, has the horse population rebounded now that more tracks are running? Your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll pivot off Andrew. Um, I do know... Uh, uh, when we all get back to the racetrack, we're going to really cherish the days, right? I think back, I think back to all those years we go, I'd go to the races and I, you know, we go uh, a day after a day. I, I can't wait to get back to really have a big crowd and to, and to cherish, you know, the electricity uh, in the, in the air. So I'll, I'll, I'll say that about getting back to the racetrack and the on track experience. So I, I don't think it's really affected the you know, the current inventory, right? The horses were the horses. 
of course, some of them shifted around. Right, but that is a concern over the next 10 years. If you look at the full crop, uh, 2021, I believe will be the first time our full crop will be under 20,000. And I think it's safe to say that, you know, there's a good chance it, it'll be in the 18,000s, um, you know, say in 2022 and, and uh, 23, because, you know, you go to the sales and, and the vast majority of people, all they want are, are the perceived uh, top of the, uh, of the of the list all they want is the is the top quality horses the middle market and below is really struggled and i think we're seeing that now in in a real time over at keeneland so i think that's something that we're going to have to pay attention to and it does come back to purses right you know when we see purses going down right we're less apt to go to a sale and to spend and to spend big money, right? We spend big money because we think that we're, you know, we'd like to think that we're going to have a shot to go to Saratoga, and and to run for a million dollars or, you know, seven fifty or, or the five hundred. So when they get chopped, I I think it really affects the outlook uh, of the owners and the agents, you know, when they go to the sales. And I, I think the cumulative effect of that. Uh, I, I think is a is a challenge for us, and I think could very easily be a, a pretty major problem because, you know, it, 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 there are two entities, right? There are betters and there are owners, and all the rest of us are at the trough uh, of, of uh, those two entities. So anything that disrupts either one of those, I, I think is, I, I think warrants our attention in a big way. I'll follow up on that with you, Terry. As somebody who has done an unbelievable job putting together racing partnerships and bringing people into the game, when we do see those factors at play, when we see purses declining, and you mentioned how difficult it is to go to the sale then and invest in a, a young horse when the purses are declining, how about in terms of attracting the new owners? What are you hearing from potential new owners that might be thinking about getting yeah. into the game? Well, I will tell you, I... I uh, for any number of reasons, we've, we've never been better with the, our pipeline. And, and I, I think some of the other partnerships are the same way uh, because I, I think people, uh, they're realizing they're, they're not going to live forever um, and, and they've built up some wealth and, and they want to do something fun. And you know, we can all agree, I, I think there's nothing more exciting or fun than this business overall. Right. I mean, I, uh, I, uh, I talked to B. Wayne Hughes and he, he said, I'd rather, I'd rather own a racing stable than an NFL team. And, and I really, I, I, I believe him. And I think a lot of other people uh, that have the wherewithal, they just, they're so into the entire system at, at, that is our, our industry. So I think in that way, it's a positive. And I think when you, you look at the sales, right, you're seeing partnerships being formed in the back of the ring. So I think all, all, all those are positive, right? But, but we do have a shortage on the ownership side. Um, and the, uh, I, I think the, a big driver uh, are the purses. So, you know, that's a concern overall that I think we all should have. Jack, another Facebook question coming in here from Facebook Live, and I'll go to you with this one. I think it fits. Um, with sports books becoming more prevalent, parlaying, sports betting, and horse racing should become more popular. How would you recommend that the money bet on a parlay be equal and, quote unquote, fenced off to stay in the racing <clears throat> business? How do we do that? Um. <laughs> Let me answer it this way. Um, sports betting can be a bane or a boon to our sport. Um, I think if we don't embrace it and make sure that our content is side by side with it, I think we run the risk of, you know, losing customers to sports betting, especially new customers that, um, you know, if we sit there and try to put a fence up and protect ourselves, I think we're just going to, you know, we're going to have dwindling returns on that. 
we need again, you know, get more distribution. The sports betting, if you know these uh, books open up for sports. W- one thing about horse racing, I tell you, in Vegas, is you know, at night you've got the games, but during the day those places are used for for racing. You know, racing is the uh, T bill that you know helps pay the overhead, and you know the stock markets, your you know your NFL games that can you know make a big return on, but they're both important to the bottom line of a book. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's why I would answer it. I mean, whether, you know, if you're doing a parlay, you know, the, I still think the interstate horse racing act applies, even if you're doing a parlay bet that involves horse racing. So you've got to have the, uh, the, uh, you know, authorization from that track to take the bet and you've got to compensate that track and its horsemen. So that is something we need to make sure we protect going forward, but we also need to embrace the new sports betters that we have access to. You know, we've touched on a lot of the different things that each of you have had to deal with this year throughout the pandemic and even touched a little bit on what things might look like into next year if we do get fans back. But uh, I'll give each of you an opportunity to answer this question. If you do look to 2021 and beyond, what does the, the picture look like for you in terms of the industry in each of your respective professions? Andrew? Good question. Um, I definitely think that, you know, there's a, there's a definite number of racetracks that are likely quite hurt by what's happened over the past six months. So I would not be surprised to see contraction in some way, shape or form, maybe even at an accelerated rate from what we're seeing right now. Um, I do think that when you look at the opposite side of it, you know, there are a lot of racetracks that never would have messed around with their schedule or never would have taken a risk to try something completely different because they didn't know what the downside looked like. Uh, And I think that the forced change in economic model for those groups um, maybe provided some additional insight to people as far as what things could look like. You know, Jack may be able to speak to it better than I could, but for a long time, you kept seeing content and racetracks consolidate around the weekends. Um, And I think that there was a lot to be learned from spreading content out over seven days a week, providing um, larger areas of less competition was probably better for everybody and did, you know, not surprisingly to a lot of people that have called for it, um, increase the whole industry's handle over, over that, you know, six month time period. Jack. And the betting uh, aspect, um, I think you're going to see, you know, with some trace tracks either closing or have it being running less race days. Um, you know, the New York casinos just reopened. Um, a lot of the casinos across the country that supplement purses are running at 25 or 50 percent capacity, and that's obviously going to hurt for future purses and probably result in less race days. Um, perhaps an unpopular thing to say. It, from a betting aspect, we probably have too many race days right now. I mean, there's more than enough to bet on, particularly as during this time with no live uh, on track crowd for the most part, people are spreading out their signals seven days a week where there's not 25 signals on Saturday and only two on Tuesday. So I think you're going to see that. Also, going to see more continued internationalization. We've been sending our signals overseas. I think you're going to see more of that and more opportunities to bet on uh, other jurisdictions around the world. But, you know, if we don't increase the distribution, you know, it's going to continue that slow, steady decline we've been on for the last 10 or 15 years. Is there a a model in place or, or could there potentially be a model in place where it's the addition by subtraction philosophy that, yes, there are going to be fewer race dates, but the quality of the races could potentially be better. Is, is that something that's even feasible if we do start to see a reduction in the number of race dates? I definitely think so. I mean, the, the difficult part is, you know, and this is the, the essential tension in our racing industry. Racetracks want 10 to 12 horse fields. Terry and his guys, they want five horse fields because they want the best shot possible at a purse. And look, and both of those are legitimate uh, goals, you know, but, you know, but the reality is we're probably all better off, you know, with big fields for, you know, excite betters and give them something to bet on 
but individually people don't want to run, you know, they'll run, run against, you know, a 12 horse field where they don't have the best chance of winning. And that's sort of that tension that's continual. So it's providing enough purses for people to make money to, you know, no one's getting rich off of horses, you know, it's, it should be a hobby for most people, but you don't want to lose your shirt. So that's the key is providing enough return to ownership to keep people interested in the game and at the same time, provide a betting product that excites people because we all know five or six horse fields get old if it's card after card of that. Yeah. Terry, you want to jump in on that? Uh, yeah. So I, I'll take an eight horse field in, <laughs> like, instead of a 12 horse field now, but you, you know, when you run in a four or five horse field as an owner, it's great, but it doesn't work. We, we know that when you're thinking about the greater good of our industry, it, 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 it doesn't work. And it's not as easy as just all the, all the second and third tier, tier tracks, all them shutting down, right? Because you need that, that ecosystem. So I, I would say that, and I, I, th I think the market, I think the market is gonna, I trust the market uh, to take care of that situation as, as we consolidate, right? Because we, we do need to consolidate, right? We have too many races. And so, going on the second and third tier tracks, I, I agree with Terry. They're absolutely essential. Um, I'm not privy to Churchill's numbers for the Derby, but we all know it was basically down 50%. And my suspicion is uh, the number one reason for that, or at least a big reason for that, is that's usually a weekend that your casual better will go to his local track, you know, for Derby Day, you know, and you're betting, your, you know, the local races and the Derby. And that's where the online doesn't translate because you want to go out to the racetrack that day. And if you couldn't go to the racetrack, those people didn't bet. So there's definitely, an, you know, that those guys are important to the ecosystem too. We just can't be left with the Churchills and the Del Mars, the Gulf Streams of the world. We'll all be out of business without the second and third tier tracks as well. Absolutely. Yep. I think to speak to both so, sides of what they're talking about, you know, the, the, the solution is not the demise of the second and third tier tracks, and it's not running four or five horse fields. So then you start to get into far more complicated issues, and it's you know likely, as Terry mentioned, uh, there's an ownership shortage. You know that's ultimately going to drive the full crop. If there's buyers for horses, they're going to breed more horses. So there's a huge ownership issue that I think needs to be addressed in a more um, comprehensive manner. You know we've done some smaller things in the state of Minnesota. Um, starting an initiative uh, specifically trying to, to address that issue, but we're certainly you know, not doing all the right things and not going to pull the industry there ourselves. Um, I think in addition to, uh, to the ownership component, there's got to be a serious look at how condition books or races are constructed and determine whether the current system you know, is the right system or whether there's other systems um, that maybe help build more competitive fields and, and, uh, give owners a better chance to, to run their horses more frequently if they've got horses that can do so. You know, I, I, I would say, I'd say to Andrew, um, when I look at, at the relationship between own, owners and trainers and the tracks and, and the ADWs, right. We have to, I think we have to be better partners. You know, I think, for, I think for a long time, uh, and we've looked at each other's uh, as on opposite sides, right? And so we have a chance now to be better partners. I, I think now that we have the federal bill and and I think that we're putting the LASIKs, that whole mess and, and the thing that the thing that really you know drug us down in a big way. Um, I, I think putting those things in the past, I think we have a shot to go forward and and, and to address and, and to be a bigger player um, in uh, uh, the landscape of, of uh, sports betting and all those other things that are coming, you know, we're going to be better off if, if uh, the two sides are, are together on the vast majority of issues. And I, I, we talk about the ADWs, right? We're uh, on the owner side, Right, we're not going to go into the ADWs and say give us a bigger chunk and, and just get it. Right, we have to have to show that we're good partners, 
and the ADWs have to be fair. Um, and I, I think if we do that, I think we're going to be stronger. And, uh, you know, we don't know what the future holds, but I do know we'll be better prepared as an industry if, in fact, we come together and we're good partners for each other. Yeah, because that's something that uh, you're hearing more conversation about now that everybody's starting to kind of look toward the ADWs that are doing so well. <laughs> are you starting to hear more rumblings that, hey, this is an opportunity for all of us to kind of look at this a little bit differently, maybe with the with the situation at hand? Yeah, well, so I mean, there's, there's yeah. two sides to that. First, remember when the pandemic hit, thank God for ADW or people couldn't have been betting at all. So yep. we've all been out of luck. So they were a lifeline those couple months when everything was shut down. But I think, um, you know, I've been in this business about 12 years now. Um, that whole 12 years, this has been an essential tension is how do you divvy up that pie and what's a fair split of it? And I do think um, particularly if stuff moves online, you're going to see, you know, I, I, it's, it's happening already in a couple of jurisdictions where horsemen are saying, wait a second, we're, we're down, you know, handle may be up, but the share going to purses is down. And so there, you know, I think needs to be an adjustment in that. Um, look, you don't want to make the margins so thin for ADWs that they don't invest. They're not out there trying to acquire customers, you know, but at the same time, you know, if you, if you squeeze it dry, there's not going to be any horse horsemen left in order for us all to have something to bet on. So it's a tension, but I, I think you'll see, honestly, I think you'll see more source market fees. I think you'll look to see more return from the ADW now that they're got a bigger portion of the betting market. So Jack, let me ask you, cause I, 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 I I'm definitely aligned with you there. From a council standpoint, what would you suggest that owners and trainers and organizations <laughs> that uh, represent owners and trainers uh, uh, do at this juncture to try to address those inequities. Okay, um, let me just do the, the standard disclaimer because my previous <laughs> life, I was an attorney. So let me say I'm speaking for myself now. Oh and my God, <laughs> you didn't disclose <laughs> that early. You should have. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I would encourage horsemen's groups to understand the numbers on their handle you know many you know guys i work with the most like the the thurban owners of california the florida horsemen are very well educated about what the handle is and where that where that takeout's going who's getting what piece of it um, that's not true for all horsemen's groups across the country to really understand you know the numbers of the betting on their product and i think you got to go for that you know look you can't Every state, you know, can't have a 15% source market fee and every track can't charge 15% for their signal because the takeout only averages about 21. So figuring out where that, you know, that middle ground is that we can all agree on. And again, you do have to leave something for the ADWs or they're going to exit the market or simply not put any investment into it. And, you know, the TVGs and the Twin Spires and the Express for the Worlds are going to be lagging behind technology wise the fan duels and the draft kings and the william hills that are coming in on the sports betting side so I, I think you need to you know protect your interests but leave room for growth by not trying to take every last dime off the table and look to grow the pie instead of just getting a, just a bigger slice of it so one more question do you think that the adw's now own that concept and, and are aware that they have to that our model has to change? Um, I'm in a kind of a unique position with Express Bet being owned by the Stronic Group. And, you know, an awful lot of the profit from Express Bet is, you know, frankly supporting, you know, racing operations in states where we're down, you know, because, you know, it hasn't, you know, Gulfstream's doing well because it never shut down, but Maryland and California were shut down for weeks and months. So, um, you know, express bets picking up the slack for it, but, you know, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, throw anybody under the bus, but yeah, I think <laughs> when the, the portion suddenly shifted instead of gradually shifted, 
I think the economics are a little out of whack right now with ADW and they need another look. That's not their fault. I mean, no one anticipated a pandemic, obviously, but you right. know, the, it shifted overnight and there needs to be some adjustment in order to make it more equitable. Andrew, from I the agree. racetrack side of things, uh, you want to chime in on this conversation and uh, this topic anyway? I mean, I see a lot of it from the, from the, state of Minnesota's perspective, because there is a source market fee within the state that does come back to the racetrack. Um, and in round terms, you know, we're trading basically every $5 that leaves the track comes back to us in about $1 in terms of return. So it, it is much different in the bricks and mortar environment within the state of Minnesota um, now than it was obviously pre pandemic. We probably have also seen a stronger rebound in the bricks and mortar business. Um, by no means where we used to be, but a stronger rebound than a lot of other places have seen that are on kind of a different time frame. But, um, you know, we, as Jack has kind of talked about, have spent a lot of time with our horsemen talking about that issue. We've probably got a little bit different relationship and that us and our horsemen have been very close for a long period of time and worked together on a lot of initiatives. Um, so I think that they, um, they understand you know, what's being talked about and, and know that um, ultimately in the long term, you know, th they need to have a better understanding kind of a, how that business model works to protect, you know, not only the racetrack, but themselves um, as the model continues to shift. Because clearly that there isn't really an upside left to them in other business opportunities other than what the ADW market sees. They, they know that overnight, you know, we're not going to double our bricks and mortar business. That's not going to happen in this day and age. Uh, and they, they know that that's really kind of where the paramutual business lies and what they need to understand and hope that they come to a good um, compromise on for all parties. Yeah, well, it's definitely a different world. There's no doubt about it. And we're all adjusting as we go. And uh, again, we're having the conversation now. The conversation will continue in the coming months and, and it will I'm no doubt take on a life of its own as we, we start to look at some different ways to do business um, in this particular environment. Um, how about, Terry, how about a, a potential from your side of things, from the ownership side, if you were to put forth a potential solution to making all of this um, work in the future so that we can make racing sustainable for new <clears throat> owners or for different entities across the industry. How about in that front? Do you have some thoughts on a way that we can potentially make this work? Well, we're talking to a bunch of, uh, of our really top students here, right, that are in the program. So I would just offer, right, there's great opportunity for people, uh, for students, right, that want to dive into this. Because if uh, you keep in mind, when I think about the horsemen's groups around the country, Mike, uh, the vast majority of them are are trying, you know, they're they're trying to get races to go. They're trying to work on the condition book. They're trying to work on the on the safety in the barn. They're trying to work with COVID to keep you know the bad trick workers all safe. So I think this is an opportunity for people who are coming into the business and, and are younger to dig into these numbers to help the horsemen. And I I just offer that. So. I don't have any, any, any clear cut options. I would just say we all have to have the will um, and the intentionality to make this better. Because we know at a certain point, right, we're gonna stop attracting owners at all, at all. We still attract owners, right? Because it's a great game and it's exciting. But at a certain point, that spigot is uh, going to turn off. So I, I just say to the, uh, the leaders of the ADW, we need to come together and um, our model has to improve. Um, and I think if we do that, I, I think that show of, of uh, good faith, I think will go a long way in any number of aspects of our industry. Jack, you've mentioned the word distribution a few times um, throughout the conversation here tonight. I'm going to assume that's one of the big keys to continuing to grow and to move forward on the ADW side. But are there others, other factors that can come into play here to kind of help the industry as a whole? Um, 
I mean, once this, once we get past this pandemic, I mean, I, you know, my personal drum I've been beating for a long time is, you know, California has, you know, 30 places you can place a brick and mortar wager, you know, and that's crazy. You know, I mean, there should be 300, really, if it was another country, there'd be 3000. And that's another thing that um, I think tracks and horsemen should be looking at in states that, you know, only have, you know, racetracks you can bet on that an OTB network. And it's not the, it's not the old system of New York OTB where you have these big, you know, dungy, you know, dingy halls with, you know, smoke and everything. You know, the new ones, you know, they're at an add-on to an existing sports bar or pool hall or bowling alley. I mean, that's, it's just a factor again, you know, trying to grow the pie by giving people more opportunities to bet. And, it, and every one of those OTBs is also a billboard for your industry. You know, it's, oh yeah, there's horse race. Where's the track? You know, maybe, maybe those people, you know, come to the track one day because they saw your OTB in their sports bar. And that's where I think a neglected part of the industry or a ne neglected part of the market that we haven't taken advantage of. Andrew, some thoughts? I definitely think that, um, you know, when you look at the comparison of the United States to other locations, as Jack mentioned, the, the just almost invisibility of the sport in the United States relative to other marketplaces is something that has to be a focal point. You know, I, it's a, it's kind of a funny sidebar, but our, our track name is pretty unique in the fact that it doesn't really have any geographical um, significance within the state of Minnesota. So as people started to uh, wager on us and get to learn a little bit more about us on a Monday through Thursday schedule this year, I feel that a lot of questions about whether I was Canterbury, Australia or Canterbury, United Kingdom. So the fact that, um, that in at least in the larger wagering market, that Canterbury, United States, did not have any sort of uh, significant brand recognition was a good reminder uh, that, that we're just not reaching a broad enough audience and whether that be through physical um, locations or through a re, you know, uh, refocused kind of effort on brand awareness or marketing campaigns uh, or quite frankly, both and plus more. Uh, I think that that was a good wake up call to me that, that um, the industry sometimes when you're in it and live it and breathe it every single day, you don't realize uh, how small of an ecosystem and how small of a network it is. Um, so to get out there and to to make yourselves known to whether it be your local market, if that's where you're within, or a national market that doesn't have exposure to you or the sport um, is an important thing that I think often gets missed in this industry. We're too easy to, to focus on the small captive audience that we already have and uh, have too easily given up on the more general public that I think still does have um, interest and it uh, definitely would show some excitement in the sport if they knew a little bit more about what it was, what it was, and what it had to offer. Yeah, a national marketing campaign would be awfully nice, wouldn't it? Without a doubt, <laughs> it certainly would. Uh, Jack, I'm going to go to you. We have another Facebook question here from uh, uh, somebody who is watching online. Uh, what role do rebates play in the horse racing business model? So the rebates where um, you give a portion back, you're essentially giving part of the takeout back to the player. Um, I think they serve an important role in your bigger players. Look, I, I don't deserve a rebate. You know, if I go to the track, I bet a couple hundred dollars on a Saturday. Um, you know, I'm there primarily to have action. If I win, great. If I lose my two, three hundred dollars, I lose my two, three hundred dollars and I go home. Um, it, you know, it's not too different for me whether I do that or go play blackjack or bet a sports game or whatever. I'm, I'm betting for action. Um, and that's frankly one of the most important parts of our betting market. And we need more of those people who just want action. The guys who, you know, not necessarily trying to make a living, but who are spending time handicapping, have some degree of knowledge, some degree of acumen where, you know, they, you know, they might be able to win at a 95% rate um, or even a 90%. But if you give 5% of their the takeout back to them, that puts them closer either breaking even or make a little money and their handle can actually go up significantly because they can churn a lot more. So, but, you know, if you're, you know, you're betting, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars a year, sure, you deserve that. But, you know, if, you're a $2 better like myself, you know, probably not. And there's a scale there. And I, you know, again, it's figuring out 
um, you know, what, what's the market, you know, what, what's the proper level, um, you know, for that is sometimes more of an art than a science, you know, going back to this discussion on ADWs and source market fees and that type of thing, you know, if your source market fee is, you know, 11%, like it is in one state, you know, that doesn't leave any room to rebate a big player who, you know, might be betting a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And if he gets, you know, 10 grand of that back, you know, he feels a little better, like he might get some of his losses back in Vegas, but if he can't get any rebate, you know, maybe he goes bet sports or something, you know, and that's something to consider. And when you're figuring out how to divide up that pie, you need to leave something to rebate those bigger players because they're an important segment of the market. Yeah, it's interesting. Let me throw this question out to you guys. I'll just throw it out to the group and anybody can jump in. Uh, and if you want to turn it into a conversation, a discussion, that's fine too. Um, with so many state governments now going through this pandemic, they're going to be looking for ways to increase funding and different options to look at racetracks that are receiving revenue from casinos and some of the deals that are in place there. Is there a concern that governments could start to take a closer look at the way that that revenue is given to the racetrack and to the horsemen? I can address that in a New York, certainly there's a concern um, and we're going to do everything we can to try to influence and, and to show, you know, the value of the thoroughbred industry overall, the farms and the, and the tracks and all the, all the other things that go along with operating a thoroughbred industry. So I think I've, our biggest, uh, you know, our best response is to show an industry that is thriving, right? I mean, we don't have a very good case uh, to go to state capitals all over America and, and say we need more help, right? We, we have to endeavor to be as strong as possible and, and to really thrive and to, and to show, right, that the and that the supplements out of the VLTs are, are driving an industry to bigger and, and uh, better things. Up to now, I, I think overall that hasn't happened, um, but I think we have an opportunity now. We, we, we're, we're on a lot more cell phones than we've ever been. Um, and I think, I think racing turns into a technology play in a, in a lot of respects. And I, I look at the younger generation in, in the thoroughbred industry, and there are a lot of people you know, that are in their, in their 20s and 30s uh, that are thinking of, uh, you know, about how to make our business even better uh, through technology. So I, I just think our job is to focus on, on the things that we can focus on and, and to make our business better. And I think when we're better, you know, our case uh, our case is stronger in the state governments um, and the state capitals across the country. Uh, uh, you know, otherwise, you know, we're, you know, we have to deal with that too. That's going to, that's a lingering issue that I think uh, it is a danger zone for us in a big way. I, I think we all realize that, right. We, and that's not uh, breaking news to anybody in our industry with the supplements and, and, yeah, you know, the revenues and the the uh, the per supplements uh, that we've had from the VLTs um, uh, all over the country. So, I, that would be uh, my take on um, on the slot machines and and their impact on our business overall. Yeah, I can remember Terry the conversations that were had when the VLTs and the the racinos first started to come into existence, and there were so many traditionalists that were opposed to that model because the theory was what the state gives, the state can take it the way. And for the most part, it's been okay so far, but we're in a pandemic and states are gonna be looking for different ways to recoup some of the, the monetary losses that they've endured with, with the pandemic. And they could very well look into this a little bit closer. Andrew, have you noticed any of that or is that even a concern at Canterbury Park? Not as much of a concern based on how uh, our purses are funded, although we've got some different 
considerations. I think specifically to, to really any, um, whether you want to call it a supplement or a subsidy, however you want to look at it, I think that any, any of those programs, regardless of whether it's racing or not, are going to be evaluated. Um, like you've said, you know, the, the largest thing that, that has really impacted Minnesota to the positive over the years has been our ability to um, kind of push and, and really uh, establish a relationship within uh, the ag community. Um, I think all too often, you know, people immediately take uh, horse racing to Kentucky Derby to wealthy horse owner. And if you can shift the narrative to horse racing to horse, to number of people that it requ is required to get that horse to the fact that it's at the races, you can pretty quickly shift people's um, understanding and view of the industry. And I think if, you know, especially in the Midwest, if there's, if there's one area that's been hit um, harder, you know, the ag communities are really suffering right now. So I think to, to pull that connection to the ag community, show the, the impact that it has on agriculture and ag agribusiness um, can be a compelling, uh, compelling story um, as people kind of look at long term, you know, how to justify the amount of money or resources that may be going to purses, because it's not just about going back to the owner, it's about this ecosystem that it sustains. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up about the agriculture side of things, because it makes me think about all of the off the track thoroughbred organizations and it just another um, element of this whole conversation. Right now, they are taking in horses that are retired race horses. They're reconditioning them for other careers um, in other equine disciplines. And if the full crop numbers decline and the racing declines, and is there, it, it, could it be possible that we could see shortages of horses, not just in thoroughbred racing, but in these other disciplines too, because we're not generating as many off the track thoroughbreds for these other organizations too? Could that be part of this whole conversation? I think it's I would think Mike I, I go ahead Terry. Yeah, I, I I think we're we've done such a good job as an industry in the last say 8 years, you know, the TAA was really yeah. the the driving force. You know, Jack Wolf, I I remember the meeting that we had at uh at, at Belmont Park the day before the Belmont probably 10 years ago and you know Jack Wolf and you know the group of people that were the founders of, of uh, TAA. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not sure, I think we're just getting to a point where we're, we're able, able to take care of the, uh, you know, the ones that are coming off, off uh, the racetrack, um, but it's gonna be a challenge. It, it will continue to be a challenge, right? Cause we, you know, you, you, know, you figure 20,000 horses a year, um, you know, that's a pretty, you know, that requirement uh, to take our horses at the end of their career, that's a pretty significant requirement. Uh, but it certainly helps uh, the fact that our full, I think that that is um, a benefit of, of our full crop coming down. But, you know, that you know, that issue will be a longstanding uh, challenge for our, our industry. And we just have to do everything we can on a on a very regular basis to take care of horses um, after they get finished their uh, careers. But I think the good thing is we're seeing how, how effective it can be done. And you know, horses that are turned into, um, into really good performers in all the disciplines that they're, they're open to. And I, I, I think we're starting to open the eyes of, of, of the horse world across the country that thoroughbreds can be really good, really, really good at a second career. And I think that's helped us. Andrew, any other thoughts on that? I just echo the, the last statement that Terry made. I think that people's eyes really have been opened in the last three to five years as to um, what thoroughbreds can do. And I think that the industry's efforts and, and really focus on um, providing better second careers it has been very helpful, um, not only from that standpoint, but also from, you know, when you look at it from an agriculture component, what impact that has on state economies and on their agribusiness as those horses continue to stay within their state 
um, live out their lives doing whatever second or third careers they come to, uh, that's a substantial impact that, that is, you know, made on that state's agribusiness and, and the economy that, um, you know, oftentimes goes kind of uncounted as you look at economic impact statements. So making sure that we're doing the right thing and taking care of uh, horses for good second and, and third careers, if you will, obviously is important for um, just doing the right thing, but it also has an important economic impact on the overall equine and agriculture business in your state. Yeah, Jack, anything to add to that topic? Um, you know, on the supplement issue, uh, you know, Greyhound racing is going away in Florida at the end of this year. Um, and it was outlawed in a referendum. And the reality is one reason it passed is many of the Greyhound tracks supported it because they were owned by casino companies that wanted to get rid of the expense of racing. So I think, you know, for those horsemen whose tracks owned by a casino that may or may not care about, you know, the future of horse racing, it's incumbent on those horsemen to think long-term and use those supplements as a way to try to, you know, as fuel to, you know, to create something bigger than, you know, to create betting on the product, create a good product that people want to bet on. Um, so if that supplement goes away way one day, like it has in a couple of jurisdictions, you're not left, you know, with a, a shell of an industry because you don't have anything to support it anymore. So I think that is important. Yeah. All right. So we've got about, uh, looks like about six or seven minutes left before we have to wrap it up. Um, I'll give you guys an opportunity for a parting shot here in just a minute. Your, your final thoughts on everything we've talked about today. If there's anything else you want to throw out there, feel free. Uh, but we did get another Facebook uh, question in uh, from a viewer. And uh, I, I, this is right in my wheelhouse. So I'll go ahead and answer this one very quickly. And then we'll go to each of our panelists. When you listen to a broadcast with horse racing, you have to be acquainted with racing in order to climb into the vernacular. Think of the newbie and they're hearing analysis like this horse was really on the bit or in the bit. How engaged will they be in the long haul? And I think that's really, really interesting. It's something that I preach about all the time. Um, whenever we broadcast races like the Kentucky Derby and the Triple Crown in our production meetings, and it happens the same way on TV too with the NBC folks, in the production meetings before those broadcasts, one of the first things that's brought up is to remember that because it's the Kentucky Derby or the Preakness or the Belmont, you're getting a lot of people tuned in that are just casual sports fans that could conceivably eventually become a horse racing fan if you don't talk over their head. And it's a fine line because you don't want to alienate the people that are in the industry and know about the game, but you have to be careful. You have to explain some of those terms that we use every day. Um, you know, changing leads is one that we take for granted. And if somebody on the broadcast says changing leads, you kind of have to expound upon that a little bit and uh, cater to the people that are tuning in that aren't horse racing people. So I agree with that 100%. I think that there are plenty of times when when we have an opportunity to explain things to people. Broadcasts aren't necessarily the place to do it, but we need to do it there. Um, it comes back to our marketing conversation that we had earlier. I can remember, and Terry, you may remember this when I first met you. Uh, I was doing the radio shows with a gentleman by the name of Pete Coolis, who has now passed away. And uh, Pete would help host seminars at Saratoga that were um, all about the language of racing. And, and not just, you know, a furlong is an eighth of a mile, but what is a furlong? Where did that name come from? You know, what does it trace back to? And, and he was brilliant with that kind of stuff. And it was fascinating. But to me, like any industry, if you're going to attract new people, you have to know the language of that industry or that sport first before you can really make them fans. So that's a long winded answer to that question, but I, I do think it, it leads into a marketing discussion, a broadcasting discussion. I think you can go a lot of ways with that one. So I hope that answered your question and we'll give each of our panelists a chance for a parting shot. Terry, let's start with you. Your final thoughts on what we discussed tonight. Well, I have uh, two thoughts. Um, one is I just offer to owners around the country, right? Get involved with your horseman's organization, right? It, uh, uh, of course, it's work. And a lot of people own horses uh, to enjoy the sport and to get away from you know, their businesses or their politics, right? But we need people that are thinkers uh, and that are in a position to bring value to organizations. And I, I think if we did that across the country and in, in a uh, in a better way and 
in a more effective way, I think we'd have a stronger voice. Um, and, and the final thought is, you know, we have a lot of challenges, right? We have a lot of work to do in our industry. I, I don't know anybody that, I, that could uh, disagree with that, right? But the, the key thing that we have is, is the concept that a bad day at the track is a lot better than a, a good day anywhere else. And that at its core, right, should drive us all uh, to attack these problems and the challenges. And I just offered to the students uh, in the program, like you, you have, you know, after you graduate, you'll have a great opportunity uh, to really make a, a, um, a substantive impact on our industry. All you got to do is find your path. And I just say good luck to all of you. Jack? I would say I, we're an important stage in our industry, important time in our industry where we've had a slow, gradual de uh, decline over the last few years. I think we can reverse that. Uh, I think we have a great opportunity with the increased exposure we've gotten this year, but it's going to take a lot of effort across the board. There aren't any silver bullets and we need to improve the customer experience, improve the owner experience and improve the better experience in order to grow this sport so we can all live and thrive and it'll be here long after all of us are gone. Yeah, well said. Andrew, how about you? Yeah, I think um, more or less summarizing what both of them said uh, and invoking a political quote, but in a different manner, never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, <laughs> but a crisis for a lot of different people in a lot of different ways and the waste in this instance would be not using the lessons that we've learned um, from it to try to do better, to try to learn from our mistakes in the past um, and to kind of push forward with maybe a new direction towards where we want to go. Um, so don't let the opportunity to learn from this go to waste. See what you can absorb, take lessons from it. Uh, and, and from that, we can all be better. Yeah, well, gentlemen, thank you very much for taking the time to be part of this and have this conversation tonight. Uh, thorough, thoroughly fascinating to hear your thoughts on this topic. And I'm going to turn it back over to Sean Byrne now, who has just rejoined us. Sean, take it away. Thanks, Mike. And thanks to all of you for joining us tonight, panelists. Outstanding. I can't believe it went by that quickly. That was the fastest 75 minutes I think I've had in a long time. The discussion was fascinating tonight. We really appreciate your support. And thank you for supporting the program, the University of Louisville and our equine industry program. Uh, I wanna let everybody out there know that our next panel will occur on October 13th, another Tuesday night, same time at 5.30. A little bit of a different shift and we're gonna go over to the breeding side of the business and we're gonna talk about sales. And the title of the panel is called Waiting for the Gavel to Fall, Kentucky Horse Sales Go High Tech. Terry alluded to it earlier tonight in our conversation. And we're going to take a deeper dive and we're going to have Boyd Browning from Basic Tipton. We'll have Duncan or Mark Taylor from TaylorMade Sales. And we'll have David Engordo of Engordo Bloodstock Services. And then we'll have a couple of our own. Equine graduate Jack Carlino, who started a company called Wanamakers, will be with us. And our host for that event is going to be one of our equine graduates, Megan Devine. So you'll want to turn in, tune into that event again Tuesday, the 13th of March. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you for your support. Have a good evening. And it was a great, great discussion. Thank, Thank you, Sean. Everyone. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Mike. Great job. Thanks, guys.